All right, if you didn't, go ahead and turn over there to John 13 or navigate on your device. That's our text this morning, John 13, verses 16 through 38. The topic we find there, Jesus quotes Psalm 41.9 to predict Judas' betrayal, except he doesn't acknowledge him as my friend. The title of the message, You've Got a Fiend in Me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together today. I'm always struck, Lord, at how unique uh, is your work. We are a unique gathering of your saints and perhaps a few that don't know you. It's never happened before. It'll never happen like this again. This is a moment in time, Lord, where you have brought us together. You're here ministering to each heart. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. There are things you want to teach us and show us and encourage us in, perhaps things that we need to repent of. Whatever work you desire to do in our hearts today, Lord, we we pray that we would be open to it, that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit says to us individually and the church corporately. Guide and direct us, Lord, in Jesus' name, and those who agreed said, amen. Do you have a tell? A tell is an action, physical or verbal, that gives away information about you. In Frozen 2, Anna recognizes that Elsa, rather, wears their mother's scarf when she's worried. In Kung Fu Panda, Uguay tells Poe, you eat when you're upset. I don't know what my excuse is. We mostly think of tells in card games like poker, hence the term poker face for those who don't have any tell. Judas Iscariot had a tell. We saw it in chapter 12. Jesus and the disciples were celebrating Lazarus' return from the grave when this happened. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. His tell was to express outrage over resources that could have been uh, turned into cash so that he could steal it. The Lord knew about Judas, but the 11 disciples never picked up on his tell until after he betrayed Jesus for money. There were two other notable betrayals in the New Testament. Diotrephes appears to have been a church elder. The apostle John called him out saying, Diotrephes loves to have preeminence among them and does not receive us. The Apostle Paul had a traveling companion and fellow missionary named Demas. Paul's final mention of him is this, Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Judas will always remain unique in the brotherhood of Bible betrayers, but there were and there will be others. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, Jesus prepares you when he is being betrayed. And number two, Jesus protects you when he is being betrayed. Let's take a look at his preparation in verses 16 through 30. This is from a recent article in the Christian Post. After announcing his divorce, Joshua Harris, author of I Kissed Dating Goodbye, former pastor of a megachurch in Maryland, renounced his faith, saying, I have undergone a massive shift in regard to my faith in Jesus. By all the measurements I have for defining a Christian, I am not a Christian. We're not talking about backsliding. Neither are we talking about disagreements or hurt feelings or being let down by other believers. Betrayal is to renounce Jesus Christ. It hurts, it confuses, it can cause you to stumble in your walk. That article about Josh Harris goes on to talk about uh, the pain that's, that it's causing the congregation, the, this man that they followed for years and who was somewhat famous in the Christian community who says, I, I'm not a Christian. The first thing to do is to put betrayal into perspective. You may not agree with me, but this is what I suggest. The betrayal has nothing to do with you. You are not the one being betrayed. Jesus is. Now, I understand it hits hard and and it's a blow, but it's it's really not you. It's an issue between the Lord and that person. 
In fact, and this may sound strange, someone else's betrayal of the Lord ought to give you a greater resolve to finish well and to just continue to really serve the Lord. Nevertheless, knowing our frailty, the Lord does everything he can to prepare us for betrayals. He cares more for you than he does for himself. This night, it is a few hours before he's going to be, uh, you know, have false trials and be beaten and crucified and all, and he's concerned that his disciples are going to be hurt and wounded by the betrayal of Judas, one in their midst. And, and so that's a, a, an amazing thing. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't just wash their feet physically. He washes our feet in every possible way, loving us more, obviously, than he loves himself. It was Thursday night of Passion Week. Jesus had just washed his disciples' feet, as I said, including Judas, which is a mind blower. And so we pick it up in verse 16. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are, they, are you, rather, if you do them. The world of the disciples was about to be severely shaken up. Their expectations of the kingdom of God on earth would be crushed. Peter would return to fishing for fish rather than fishing for men. No matter what it might look like for the next few hours and days, he would be sending them out as planned. They would serve the Lord, each other, and others. They would thereby be blessed, Jesus says, not just in the future when rewarded in heaven. The promise is that they would be blessed in the work itself. They'd be doing what they loved. In their case, all except John would die a martyr. You might say they would die doing what they loved, serving the Lord. And I, I don't say that flippantly or to be funny, but these guys were willing to die at, at any moment, at a moment's notice. They knew that that was just part of what it was all about. And God said to them, you will be blessed in the work. Certainly there's a reward coming, but your life is going to be blessed as you serve the Lord. And what greater blessing could there be than to serve the risen Lord, the creator of heaven and earth? I mean, you know, it's, um, and we didn't really even have to pass a job interview for it. Do you understand that? You, you know, if you want a job, you have to interview and be vetted and do all this stuff. God picked us. He, you know, we, we got saved and he said, now you're a servant. I, I want you to serve me. And what a blessing just to have that position, regardless of where our service finds us. And so we are indeed blessed. Verse 18, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, and the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. The Lord's concern, again, I say, is for the eleven. He did not want them to be stressed by Judas's betrayal. He told them in order to prepare them before it happened so that they would understand it did not take heaven by surprise. In Psalm 41, verse 9, King David described a personal betrayal. His close counselor, Ahithophel, would betray him by supporting the rebellion of his son, Absalom. Jesus applied that to Judas and said what Judas was doing was a fulfillment of it. It was not a direct prophecy of something only Judas could do. Albert Barnes explains it this way. He says, it does not mean that Judas was compelled to this course in order that scripture might be fulfilled, but that this was foretold and that by this prophecy, he did receive a completion. If not Judas, someone else would have fulfilled the future predictions of Psalm 41, verse 9. Now, if that scene sounds odd, it sounds odd to me as well, but consider this. Could John the Baptist have been Elijah? Well, if you're familiar with Jesus' comments about him, he said, if you had received it to his followers, he was Elijah who is to come. And so in some prophetic sense, in some biblical sense, uh, John the Baptist could have fulfilled this Old Testament prophecy. And he didn't because they uh, rejected the kingdom. And so now we'll see Elijah in the future during the Great Tribulation. And so what I'm saying is that Judas wasn't unique in being able to fulfill this scripture. 
whoever it was who would betray Jesus, whether it's Judas or someone else, uh, would have been the fulfillment of that scripture. We like the providence of God. We love the providence of God by which he provides for himself his, and his plan and keeps things tracked. In the Old Testament, my favorite example, in the book of Esther, you know the story probably. Esther was the queen of Persia, but no one knew she was a Jew. And then this guy Haman, who had the ear of the a king, he decided that it would be legal to kill all the Jews in the empire, in the Persian empire. So they announced that they could do it. And so Uncle Mordecai comes to uh, Esther and he says, hey, um, you're the queen. Seems like you're in a position to do something about this. And Esther balks at first. She says, the king will kill me. Because if you, you didn't just walk in. You didn't, in fact, you didn't even knock on the door. Uh, unless he called for you, you didn't go and see the king of Persia uh, because he would kill you. And so she had a, a fear. And uh, Mordecai, who's really not a very spiritual guy either, he, had, he said something remarkable in the effect that he said, if you don't do it, God will raise someone else up to do it. Wow. I mean, I would think that he would say, don't you understand you're the only one who can do this? See what God has done to bring you to this position? No one else is there. What are we going to do? Oy vey. <laughs> right? Instead, he said, you ought to do this. It seems like it's God sent, but if you don't, God will help. We're not worried about it. And so that's what I'm saying. You know, some of this stuff you think, wait a minute. You know, if God, God sent Judas to his doom, he was doomed from the beginning, he was chosen to, to betray God and nothing could have saved him, that's just not true. He, uh, he did betray the Lord, but it could have been someone else. Now, here's what I'm getting at. Judas was an unbeliever who was consumed with greed. He never believed the Lord. His motivation was material and not spiritual. Eventually, he was taken captive by the devil to do his will. Maybe you're wondering about a motive for his betrayal. Consider this. All of the disciples believed they would soon be officials in God's magnificent kingdom of heaven on earth. Imagine being the treasurer of God's kingdom if you were an accomplished thief. Oh, man, this is... This is like uh, the greatest thing in the world for Judas. He would go right into being the treasurer of the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's got to be a lot of skimming off the top. I'm sure he had his Cayman Islands accounts ready, his Swiss bank accounts, all of those things, you know, by, to launder money. Maybe Judas figured out that Jesus was not going to inaugurate the kingdom because Jesus kept saying, I'm not going to inaugurate the kingdom. I'm going to be crucified and all. And Judas, being a thief and greedy, thinks, I better cut my losses. If I can betray the Lord, I heard that these guys are willing to pay for a betrayal, 30 pieces of silver are better than nothing. Because he was greedy. Now, I don't think we usually put greed, even though it is one of the seven deadly sins, um, we don't think about greed so often. May, or maybe you do. I, I don't, not that I'm not greedy. It's just I don't think about it. Maybe, maybe it makes me more greedy. I don't know. But Satan was greedy. And you think, well, that's, what kind of motive is that? It's, a, it's an amazing motive. He was an unbeliever who was greedy, and he eventually came under the full control of the devil. The reason some say Judas must have been saved was because he participated in doing signs and wonders. You know who else did signs and wonders? Janus and Jambres, those are the magicians in the Old Testament book of Exodus who did a lot of the things that Moses could do. Another uh, person who is going to do signs and wonders is the false prophet of the book of the Revelation in the future. And so it's, it's not a problem. It seems odd that God would allow it, but there are times when unbelievers are enabled to do signs and wonders and miracles. In fact, in Deuteronomy, I'll just refer to it, it's Deuteronomy 13, the Lord basically says, hey, if, if a person does a sign or wonder and it comes to pass, but they try to lead you astray, that person is not genuine. I let them do that to test you. And so if your argument is Judas could not have preached the gospel, he could not have done miracles, of course he could, and he did. I always wondered who was paired up with Judas, who, you know, when they went out two by two. And can you imagine the ribbing that that disciple got? Hey, hey, 
you were with Judas, right? Yeah. You never caught on? You never understood that he wasn't a genuine disciple? Well, we need to work on your discernment, brother. You know, I mean, just it's interesting interpersonal relationships. Judas was never saved. Most assuredly, verse 20, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Jesus was sent by God the Father. Jesus would send the disciples. They would have a to the end of the earth ministry ahead of them. The betrayal and the cross would not be the end. And so again, among what he's saying in these verses that don't deal directly with Judas is we're still on task. People are, you're going to be sent out. People will receive you. When they receive you, they're receiving me. When they receive me, they're receiving my father. There is a ministry that is coming. Don't get freaked out by what's happening tonight. It's all part of the plan. When Jesus had said these things, verse 21, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Jesus had a lot to say, but from here on, he had it only to say to his disciples. He needed to dismiss the betrayer. Verse 23, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Uh, John kind of takes on this alias of the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's like his super ego or something like that, you know. But uh, I, I think it's kind of cute. I think it's out of humility. I mean, he's certainly not bragging. He, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you don't brag, right, uh, about being the one that Jesus loved. Uh, or maybe it's more of an inside thing between him and the other disciples. Hey, guys, uh, you remember me? The one that Jesus loved is here, you know, that kind of thing. There's that, there's that scene, I wonder if I can get this right. It's in the Thor, one of the Thor movies, Ragnarok, I think, where he's trying to get this, the Quinjet to respond to his voice. And he says, uh, you know, they, something like they want to identify yourself. And he goes, Thor, strongest Avenger, strongest Avenger, strongest Avenger. And it won't give him that. And he finally has to say point break or something like that because, uh, you know, Tony Stark is goofing off all the time. And so, uh, you know, G hey, who's out there? Uh, the disciple Jesus loved. <laughs> Just kind of cute. And so he, he wasn't using Jesus for a pillow. He's leaning on his bosom, it says in verse 23. It means he was on Jesus' right-hand side. John will several times refer to himself as the disciple he loved uh, because he was the closest, probably, in, on the table. Simon Peter, verse 24, therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Now, this is hilarious to me. This, this is a bit of comedy on this otherwise uh, dark night uh, because Peter is sitting uh, in proximity to John and Jesus had just said, you know, he was going to identify this person and Peter's trying to figure out who it is and he's trying to get John's attention. You ever have to do this sometimes? But you have to be discreet. You don't want to interrupt Jesus, right? And so it's like, <clears throat> <clears throat> Nothing. John! <clears throat> and all of this is going on, and finally John looks at him, you know, and, and, and Peter says, hey, ask him, ask him. It's pretty, it's pretty cute, really. Verse 25, then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Whatever else the dipped bread signified, it showed compassion towards Judas Iscariot by not overtly exposing him as Satan's covert operative. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him, and then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. This is fascinating, is it not? It, Jesus, at his dinner, is talking to the devil, and he orders him out. He says, hey, it's time. Go do it. It's incredible, all this stuff, when you just stop for a few minutes and think about it. We typically say that Judas was possessed by Satan. I've been rethinking this whole idea of possession. It comes down to this. Are demons synonymous with fallen angels? Because Satan is a fallen angel, and we're saying that he can possess a human being, if you believe in that, right? And, and so can, are demons fallen angels? Well, maybe, and that is the majority opinion of scholars today. 
But they even agree that nowhere in the Bible does it directly say that demons are fallen angels. One scholar writes and he says, equating fallen angels with demons arose in the second and third centuries AD. It was an invention of late ancient Christian writers. After a lengthy scholarly paper published in the Journal of Bible Literature, he concludes, for most ancient Jews and Christians before the second and third centuries, angels and demons were two distinct species. And so demons were something else. They weren't angels. They weren't fallen angels. They weren't cherubim or seraphim. They weren't rulers of the powers of darkness or any of the other things we read about. Uh, they were their own category. The New Testament accounts about demons always portray them as obsessed with having a body. They, they want to possess someone or something. If you had not been taught otherwise, you'd conclude in those passages that demons are disembodied spirits looking for a host. And so a current theory that many scholars are gravitating towards is that demons may be the disembodied spirits of Old Testament race of giants called the Nephilim. Remember in Genesis chapter 6, uh, angels had sexual relations with human women and they, uh, the offspring were a race of weird giant cannibals. Uh, and and uh, mo they were destroyed in the flood uh, but their spirit is somewhere, right? They're, you know, they're not men, they're not angels, and they're not accounted for in the Bible in terms of where their spirit is going to end up. And so it could be that they are disembodied spirits who roam the earth looking for a host. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting theory, um, just something to think about. When it says Satan entered Judas, it need not mean that he possessed him in the sense of going into his body the word can describe a influence as well. We read in the New Testament, Satan takes unbelievers captive to do his will. It doesn't mean he possesses them. It means that he, uh, you know, they continue to reject the Lord, get farther and farther from God and from morality, and Satan is able to influence them to do what he wants them to do. Jesus knew the timeline. He dismissed the devil to do his work to play his part. Jesus is in charge of this last night, as he was of everything, of course, but especially he wants to show that none of this was an accident, none of this uh, was a surprise to his father and himself. No one at the table knew for what reason he had said this to him, for some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things that are needed for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Jesus chose his words carefully to mask Judas's betrayal. Imagine that had they known what Judas was up to, the evening would have gone very differently. You can't tell me that Peter wouldn't have impulsively gone after him with his sword drawn, or maybe even there at the table, uh, because later on he does that to one of the enemies of, of the Lord who comes for him. And so Jesus is being very careful. Having received the piece of bread, he went off immediately, and it was night. For three and a half years, Judas had been exposed to the light. In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Yet the, Judas never came to that light. In the end, we see him in darkness. Judas is not a tragically misunderstood anti-hero. He didn't betray Jesus for a greater good, as many try to say. He was an unbeliever who had plenty of opportunity to receive the Lord and rejected the Lord in a big way. Could Judas have gotten saved? Could he have been saved? I think so. And then, as I said earlier, God would have fulfilled the scripture and accomplished the betrayal some other way. I say that mostly because God does not create people just to damn them to hell. And, and though Judas deserves his punishment, uh, God didn't overrule his will or make him just so he would go to hell. Uh, and so we have to believe that Judas could have been saying, you think, well, wait a minute, how is that possible? What would have happened? I don't know. When you can tell me how Elijah would have been John the, or John the Baptist was Elijah, then I'll answer you, right? Because that's a, that's a scriptural issue that we struggle with. Almost everything Jesus did and said in these verses was to prepare his disciples for what was coming. He warned them in advance, assuring them that they would go forward with the gospel. Jesus protects you when he's betrayed. Dante's Inferno describes hell as nine concentric circles of 
torment located within the earth. The Ninth Circuit Court is the final deepest level of hell. I'm sorry. The Ninth Circle is the final deepest level of hell. It is reserved for traitors and betrayers. Dante chose as its most famous occupant Judas Iscariot. And so greed, betrayal to Dante in his epic poem, these were things that were way worse than anything else. Verse 31, so when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. The cross was shameful, but Jesus described it as bringing glory to his Father and himself. Son of Man, as we've seen before, is the Lord's favorite title for himself. It's a title for the Messiah found in the book of Daniel. He mentions glory five times in these two verses. Jesus would be glorified on the cross. He would say, it is finished. A centurion would witness the cross and say, truly, this was the Son of God. Uh, Not a, a, a perfect testimony, but at least he understood that the cross was glorious. God the Father was glorified because now he could, on account of Jesus' sacrifice, justify sinners. And they brought glory to each other, Jesus for his humility and the Father for his exaltation of Jesus. All of this and more would be the immediate effect of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Grant Osborne writes, here is that supreme paradox. The most horrifying event in history is at the same time the most glorious. Verse 33, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come, so now I say to you. The word that came to mind is abandoned. It's a word you, use, uh, you should never use to describe the treatment of children. Jesus was soon to return home to heaven. It would seem an abandonment to the disciples. They had lived with Jesus over three years. They expected him to inaugurate the kingdom of God on earth. They had given up everything for him. They had been lobbying for their assignments. For the disciples, his departure would only be temporary, however, not an abandonment. He would come again for them. For the Jews, leaving them would be final. He would return to heaven and they could not follow him because of their unbelief, that generation of Jews that had rejected him. Verse 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love one another is nothing new. Love one another as I have loved you is something new. Two things come to mind regarding the way Jesus loved them and us. His love was expressed on the cross where he gave himself for us. Thus, if we are to love as he does, we must lay down our lives. The Lord's love is enabled by the gift of God the Holy Spirit given on the day of Pentecost. Thus, if we are to love as he does, we must continue in the spirit and not in the flesh. We here love one another and can't help but think it's a DIY project where we need to go to the bookstore and get the books on love and find out how do I love somebody and all of those different things. But we could never love one another the way the Lord loves. No amount of studying, not even praying. It requires the indwelling Holy Spirit and are yielding to him, Uh, especially in these unredeemed bodies. I I will never love as fully as Jesus loved, but that is the standard, and the Holy Spirit can uh, prompt me to walk in that love and show that love uh, and, and show Jesus. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him. He says, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Now think about this. They were in Jerusalem where the Messiah would rule on King David's throne. A few days prior, the crowds hailed Jesus as King of the Jews with shouts of Hosanna. Where could Jesus possibly be going? Uh, I mean, the mindset of the Jews, of his disciples, is this is the moment of the kingdom. John came preaching the kingdom. Jesus preached the kingdom. They were ready for the kingdom. The king was in Jerusalem where the kingdom was. And so Peter, I think, is saying, hey, are, are we going to Rome? Do we have to defeat the Romans in Rome before we can set up our kingdom? I, I, he just doesn't understand where they're going. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? 
I will lay down my life for you. If we're correct in assuming the disciples were anticipating the kingdom, it could be that Peter meant he would be willing to fight for Jesus against the Roman legions. In fact, that's what he started to do when they came for Jesus in the garden. He pulled his sword and he cut off the ear of Malchus. Peter volunteered to be a sword-wielding soldier. Jesus was preparing Peter to be a scattered sheep. They were way far apart on what was happening. There are a lot of metaphors to describe believers in the church age. Soldier is one of them. Sheep is one of them. So is steward, servant, slave, builder, building, betrothed, bride, farmer, athlete, vessel, etc. In the 1960s, a guy named Paul Menier published a paper listing 96 metaphors, what he called images of the church. This morning we sang that there are a thousand names for our beloved Savior. Don't be cutting off soldier-like ears when the Lord might want you to be washing servant-like feet, right? That's the point here. We, we have to get it right. We have to be in the illustration Jesus has for us at the time. And Peter, Peter thought it was a time to fight and to be soldier of the Lord. And Jesus says, no, no, you're missing the point. Tonight you're going to be a scattered sheep. And you're going to need all of my prayers to keep you uh, from wandering too far. Verse 38, Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Adam Clark writes, Jesus must first die for Peter before Peter can die for him. Jesus has to die and raise from the dead and convey to Peter through the Holy Spirit the power to actually die for him. Peter would survive his denial mostly because Jesus protected him. John doesn't record it, but Jesus said to Peter, Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Peter failed, yet his faith did not fail. Baptist pastor Jack Hiles once said, Failing is not a disgrace unless you make it the last chapter of your book. And so let's not. The Lord's protection on Peter and on us, not always the untouchable kind, right? Satan did sift him, but Jesus protected him, and he continued to walk with the Lord. Job, right? Would you say Job was protected by God? Well, of course he was. God told Satan, you can do this and no more. You can do this and no more. Now, you and I say, hey, that's not the kind of protection I want. But you can't say God didn't protect him. Protection doesn't mean you're untouchable. It's not like witness protection in the world is not like witness protection in the Bible. Witness protection in the Bible gets you beat up and shipwrecked and starved because you're following Jesus in a world that hates him. Hopefully witness protection in the real world keeps you safe and no one knows who you are, that kind of thing. And so we need to understand when I say you know, the Lord protected him, he did but it doesn't mean Satan didn't sift him. It's just that it was necessary uh, in order for the future ministry that Peter would have. God the Holy Spirit is an important theme in Jesus' comments all that evening. Jesus will say, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Duncan Campbell said, The kingdom of God is not going to be advanced by our churches becoming filled with men and women, but by men and women in our churches becoming filled with God.